This is the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. All right, I'm going to zap her again. Charge up the paddles. Come on, let's go, let's go. Sorry, don't. Hold the compressions. Clear. Straight line. Good evening and welcome to Rock and Roll Autopsy. We are the forensic files on your radio dial. My name is Scott. And have we got a great show for you tonight? No, we don't. Damn it. The phone is ringing again. It's the request line. <sighs> All right, let's pick it up. WRNRA, East of the Rockies. Hey, breather, what's going on, man? You can't stand all the late 90s post-grunge butt rock singers and their third generation poor imitation wannabe Lane Staley yarling that dates the music and makes it immediately identifiable as third rate, uninspired, manufactured schlock. What do you mean if you wanted to hear unintelligible white guys who sound like they've got a mouth full of marbles, you'd listen to our shitty rock and roll podcast. Listen, you called the request line. Is there a song you'd like us to perform an autopsy on? <laughs> One by Creed. You got it. All right, buckle up, gang. The subject of our rock and roll autopsy tonight will be won by post-grunge mega-selling superstars, Creed. We'll get the show started after these very important messages from our sponsors. What's up, music nerds? Are you tired of wading through a sea of mediocre music, desperately seeking to find a glimmer of greatness? You're in luck. My name is Mark, and I am the host of the podcast, Songs That Don't Suck. Each week, I scour the depths of new music playlists to unearth hidden gems that defy the trends and deliver pure sonic bliss. No matter the genre, if it doesn't suck, it's on my radar. So find us on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe today. And as always, keep searching for and listening to Songs That Don't Suck. Breaking news! What is this garbage you're watching? I want to watch the news. This is the news. All right, gang, we've got our intrepid rock and roll beat reporter on the line, Rico Good News. No! With the good, the good News. Rico, how are you, sir? doing great man um how are you doing tonight i'm all right man but um i tell you what dude i am out of touch i need i need your assistance i need you to bring the rock and roll news i got you but first um i want to thank everybody out there for listening um out there in the world the universe uh in the mind of whatever thing created all of this um thank you for that because if it wasn't for them scott we would just be a couple idiots babbling on about some random bullshit. All right. Listen, let's get to the news. Oh, the other thing, real quick. This is not the second in the Did Cleveland Kill Rock series. We'll get to that. Um, just, I know you guys are itching for part two of that. It's coming. Don't worry. Hang tight. Um, let's get to the news. There's a lot of... There's a lot of shit going on in the world today, Scott. Um, people are freaking out. Um, everybody thinks the sky is falling. Uh, I mean, there, you know, between wars in Europe, um, fucking climate's bullshit, interest rates, you've got COVID for the second time. I mean, the sky is falling, right? Um, but, but in reality, uh, what we don't need 
The answer is not political and economic stability, Scott. The answer is not sustained renewable energy source. I mean, it's not any of that stuff. What we need is more goddamn Ace Freely is what we need. And guess what? In a couple of hours, as of this podcast, 10,000 volts, his new album is dropping. And guess what? All is going to be right with the world, my friend. It's coming. Because we need more Ace. Thank you. 72 years old and uh, dropping another solo record. I mean, Rico. What have you thought of the singles? I mean, I heard 10,000 volts. You sent me the other one. Was it Cinnamon Girl? What was it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, cherry Fuck. What's the name of it? It's not Cherry Fuck. It's, um, hold on. See, it's uh, cherry, cherry Medicine. That's it. Cherry Medicine. That's uh, his, his ode to his fiance. They're not married yet. I don't know. We saw them at the grocery store um, buying stuff, right? Uh, so it's his it's his love song to his partner. I don't know her name. I don't know if they're married yet or not. Uh, you are referencing a YouTube short of Ace Freely grocery shopping with his uh, partner, and it was it was definitely Ace in a grocery store. <laughs> a, 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 isn't Ace our like our Ozzy Osbourne really yes he is the American New York Ozzy Osbourne and I think I love that because of that that is the best analogy and the best <laughs> way to look at this I think I love that <laughs> framing actually because Ozzy unfortunately even though he's doing a podcast with his family now um he's kind of he's definitely um fading into the into retirement because I think yeah. his Parkinson's is is becoming more and more uh you know a part of his his story at this point so ace stepping up to fill the vacuum of doddering drugged out rock and roll has is a pretty pretty <laughs> special thank you ace freely thank you very much for that so what i've heard of the album so far is totally ace right you've heard some of it too here's my question about this the album's going to come out. He's going to want to support the album, right? Can he actually do that? Can he actually go on tour and support the album? Does he have the wherewithal and the chops and the stamina to be able to actually support this album? Or is it just going to be like a studio thing that he just puts out and then does some more YouTube videos with Eddie Trunk? He has none of that but he will still tour in support of the album he does not have stamina wherewithal chops none of these this is like the scene in rocky six when the trainer says to rocky you know speed you ain't got it you know um you, you know he, so he's got none of this stuff all he's got calcium deposits in his knees it's over you know but what he does have is a really great supporting band who will prop him up on stage and they can they can you know they can dial back the volume on his guitar <laughs> at times and uh and he can put on a competent rock and roll performance we should buy tickets if he comes around i i think we should do that actually um you don't think they can get him in enough sh listen his solos are not like fucking paul gilbert okay he you don't think that they can get him to a place where he can at least play his his own solos oh i've seen clips he's doing that for sure okay in the songs okay. he's singing them and he's playing his own leads um but the band behind him is really i mean they're doing yeah. the heavy lifting and that's that's as it should be to get 72 year old ace freely through a, a 90 minute gig you're gonna for need sure. that yeah for sure so yeah if he's coming around here we're going i i think that needs to happen was at the kent stage a few years ago that would be ideal how did we miss if he, this if he played that again that would be ideal man we could totally oh. do that 
that would be that would be my best day scott yeah i mean as long as we figure out when we can get a meal in for you prior to the show we'll be <laughs> we'll be all right we'll hit taco tantos around the corner and it'll be great listen dude ace was my very first f favorite rock star when i was a wee lad in single digits so we had to do this um um did you hear about the paul mccartney lost bass thing okay i did i'm not sure how I'm, for those of you that live in jupiter that don't know this story so back in and if anybody's seen pictures of the of the help the early on beatles he's got the hot like the sunburst hoffner with the white pit guard okay that's the base we're going to talk about in 1972 somebody stole the base i don't know who stole the base they know who stole the base who knows the point is it was gone for 52 years and apparently there was this big campaign they 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 came up with a name for it to try and find paul's lost base right well 52 years later somebody finally came forward and said oh yeah i inherited this base and it's still in the case and apparently it's paul mccartney's base and he got his base back after 52 years so i don't know and, and you can maybe speak more on this i don't know if i should be happy for the guy that he got his base back or if I should feel the same way about this as I did when he got busted for weed and got like a $200 fine, like the privilege of being famous where any other jamoke like myself would have chalked it up to being lost and, and gone forever. But no, since you're famous and you're Paul McCartney, you have the whole fucking earth planet earth looking for your base for you. And you happen to get it back knowing full well, you could probably buy 20,000 more of them and pay cash for it. So am I, I, I I clearly don't have the position to be able to comment on this. What do you think about him getting his base back? I'm happy for Paul, man. Listen, yes, tremendous resource being able to call upon the entire planet <laughs> to scour the globe for his bass guitar. But at the end of the day, Paul's in his 80s now, man. And the music, the gift that Paul gave humanity in those Beatles songs... I don't have any hate for that guy, dude. I mean, if he's oh, got his no. base back and God. he's happy, Godspeed. You know they're doing um, like biopics on all four of the Beatles. Yeah, I saw that. Are you? Are you? How do you feel about that? I, uh, you know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of over the biopic thing. Are they yeah. biopics or biopics? Did I've always called how it. How to say this? Well, you call them biopics. I've always called them biopics, but I'm sure I'm not saying it right. So I'll happily uh, go. Whatever. You're the I'm, journalist, so yeah, I I have no fucking idea. But um, I don't I don't care, dude. I mean, I I got to be honest with you, man. I think I'm over movies, so I think I'll just chalk it up as something else in my life that I'm just not going to enjoy anymore. So I think I just I don't care. Get off my lawn. Although you should watch Oppenheimer. That's a pretty good flick. It's on Peacock for nothing, I think. Um, so check that out. Anyway, so I want to mention real quick, one more before we go to break. Um, this punk festival. Uh, do you know about this punk festival at Coachella that's coming up? I heard the news, yeah. Okay, did you happen to see the lineup? I did see the lineup. Okay. Um, I don't know how you feel about this. I, f I think this is a real bad idea because m most of the people on this lineup are, are really, really old. Like, r remember, remember what Glenn Danzig looks like right now. Like, he could barely move around because of that giant boiler. He's got, like, the dude from Loverboy boiler. He's got, like, the Vince Neil boiler going on, okay? Especially, now, I could see one thing if you're doing Loverboy stuff or you know motley crew stuff but dude this is punk man like do you want to see a bunch of 70 year old dudes like iggy and danzig and all these cats do you want to see those guys trying to play their old shit when they were in their 20s especially punk man i think this is a real bad idea i personally don't want to see it but People who have gone to those reunion misfit shows. The funny thing about the reunion misfit shows is the misfits broke up in like 83. And when they did, they were playing 
like Max's Kansas City and like small dive bar venues yeah. and they never as a functioning band never rose above that and now as a reunited band of four guys in their 60s they're playing Madison Square Garden and selling it out and they've never did that in their original run ever not even close nothing like that they were playing bars in their original run and never got above that so it's so I can't, I mean, there's a market for it, man. They're selling it. It's not for me. I'm not going to go see it. But you're burying the lead. The big thing with that list of bands on there was freaking Slayer is on it five years after their retirement tour. Reunited, baby. Actually, that is that is the other festival. Ooh. That's the Louder Than Life festival that they're well, I stand correct. That. Well, no, but that that's still kind of a big deal that lineup is is similar that's more like a metal festival but that's got like motley crew slayer slipknot corn gojira you know fucking there's a big giant list this is like they're the metal version of the punk festival gotcha and yeah dude slayer how do you think feel about that slayer they got the band back together for this festival that's exciting right no i i think <laughs> it's so cheap when bands do the whole retirement shtick and do the big retirement tour and draw big crowds hey come out and see slayer it's the last time and then five years later they're playing a gig and what i can't figure out is kerry king just did this big push and this big launch and this big reveal for his first ever solo right. band, and it feels like this just steps all over that like it steals the spotlight and so from a marketing perspective, I can't really figure out like what they're doing exactly because it seems to take all the interest away from this big reveal where they had this four-year secret that Kerry King had done this solo project. So I don't know, man. It doesn't make sense. I can only imagine that he felt like, I'm going to do this solo project like Ace, dude, like those guys. I'm going to do this solo project. I'm going to put out some material, you know, get some whatever and then this other opportunity came along he's like oh i can make a fuckload more money and get more exposure because i'm getting the band back so whatever i did over here fuck that i'll come back to that another time maybe i think i'm gonna reunite with the boys and make some money and get some more pub so the the shiny the big the bigger shinier thing won over over the smaller personal material thing are you so, with me though man i hate the reunion tour i mean i hate the undoing of the retirement especially it's only been five years and like half of that was chewed up by covid so i mean Dude, I, isn't I, that kind of the point of why we're doing this podcast is to bang on shit like that of course i agree with you our first garbage episode is making fun of kiss for doing that very thing fucking the eagles have been doing their farewell tour since 1980 and we know what happened at that party we talked about it so they've they've been retiring for fucking 44 43 years now so yeah it's it's ridiculous it's stupid just let it go man be the police either be the police and quit when you got five really great albums or the alternative is be rush and tour for 40 years and sound just as good 40 years later as you did in 1970 but everybody else seems to be in the middle someplace and they can't decide that to be one or the other and that's why it's messy and that's why we don't like it i'm sure we'll see kiss on the bill next right next to slayer no we'll see the avatars right you know it'll be like two two weeks after their big retirement <laughs> show they'll be on a bill <laughs> <laughs> they're going to drop the screen and the cartoon's going to come and they're going to, okay, hit play. And then they're just going to play Kiss Alive too. Oh That's gosh. it. That's how they're going to make a billion dollars. They're just going to dial up Kiss Alive too, and they're just going to put it behind some cartoons. You know what I would like them to do that I would actually go see is if they did, remember the Super Friends? How Was that Hanna-Barbera? No. What was that? This, remember the Super Friends? Yeah, when, when we I watched it all the time, dude. What if they did a kiss concert with the animation style of the super friends and then you just go watch it on a screen and it's that would be so right meanwhile yeah in yeah. the hall of justice what did they call the dick 
<laughs> like fucking Mixel Plicks and, and is it whatever that dude's name was and, and the, the fucking the Legion of Doom and shit. Yes, like that. that's it. Yes. Banded together from remote galaxies are 13 of the most sinister villains of all time. The Legion of Doom. Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom, and then yes! they, they came up from under the water, and then there was the bald headed Lex, the guy who looks like me, the Lex, Lex Luthor, Luther and, and was... Mantis, and, yes! and all that, all that fucking hand drawn shit that, that I love that you don't get anymore. It's all fucking vector data now. Yes. Um, but it all, it all back when Hanna Barbera was fucking hand drawn everything, and they did superhero hand drawn cartoons better. And I would love to see a kiss version of that. That would I want to awesome. see a, a whole kiss concert. Concert. That's just yeah. give me a 90 minute kiss concert drawn in the style of the super friends. And I would love it. Give me that. And the animation of them playing would not even come close to matching the music because not that's how, it, and that's why it would be so great. And then have the Harlem Globetrotters come out. And because <laughs> ever that always the Harlem Globetrotters guested in every episode of the super friends or Scooby Doo uh, ever Scooby for whatever Doo. reason. And did, wasn't kiss on Scooby Doo too. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. Oh, but, and sp sp speaking of 70s Kiss, Ace Freely officially loves Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park I saw. Which, really? How could, you, how could you not? That movie is fucking classic cinema. How yeah, it didn't it win awards, I have no idea because it's I that good. Know. All right, gang. Let's take a quick break. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk some Creed. So stick around. Looking for a good rock and roll book? Do you watch a ton of rock and roll documentaries like I do? Well, that's why I started the Rock Talk Studio podcast. to be the place to go for previews, reviews, and recommendations of rock and roll books, documentaries, and movies. Every first Tuesday of the month, the Rock Talk Studio gets you caught up on all the latest and points out where to go for the good stuff. Give me 20 minutes and I'll get you caught up on the world of rock and roll books, docs, and movies from every possible angle and leave you with a no doubt decision on where to spend your time and money. Fan or just casual fan, or maybe you're on the fence and just looking for something new to check out. Either way, I got you covered. Recently on the show, I've talked about books and documentaries from everyone and everything from David Bowie, Randy Rhodes and the Allman Brothers, to the Abbey Road Studios, Cheap Trick, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Little Richard and more. Join me, Big Rick, every Tuesday of the month as I host the Rock Talk Studio podcast, the ultimate review of rock and roll books, documentaries, and movies. Our Mind on Music is a podcast that covers all things music. We cover all genres, and we welcome all perspectives, from musicians, producers, and content creators, to music enthusiasts. We have discussions, interviews, opinions, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us every week, Our Mind on Music, on YouTube and all streaming platforms. We are gathered here to remember rock and roll. Rock was born, the rambunctious son of country, western, and blues. In the year of our Lord, 1955, on this day, the birth of rock and roll, gifted under the world a gyrating pelvis, a throbbing beat, and a pulsating rhythm, a sound so infectious and rollicking that it would endow previously scrupulous young minds with identity individualism and purpose, thus setting forth a multi-generational pursuit of all that is loud, debaucherous, and unholy. But, sadly, like all earthly endeavors, rock too must perish. Oh, we mourn the loss of rock and roll with its ridiculously old standard bearers still on tour and charging ungodly amounts of Mad Jack to witness their long past the sell by date asses on stage and with its chauvinism, misogyny and whiteness no longer aligning with modern sensibilities and with its aging, fist-shaking fan base kicking every would-be rocker off their proverbial lawn, rock has indeed passed into the celestial void. May rock rest in peace in eternal cacophonous slumber. Amen.
Thank you for that, Scott. You are listening to the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. The Autopsy Report. Hey, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about, really, Scott, wouldn't you say this is a really polarizing band, Creed? Um, very polarizing band. The, the song that we're doing tonight is one from the album My Own Prison, which is their first f- excursion into the rock and roll world, and we'll get into that a little more. Um, released in 1998. Um Scott Stapp and Mark Tremonti wrote it. Um, it was produced by John Kurzweig. Um, and that's it, dude. Um, we're going to be getting into this. Did this song kill rock? I don't fucking know. Some people will say yes without even listening to this autopsy. And some people will say, fuck you. I love Creed. So it's going to be one extreme or the other with this band. But we're going to put, we're going to get all of that opinion out of it. And we're going to really tell everybody if it really did kill rock. Thank you, Brico. Yeah, that's right. You are listening to Rock and Roll Autopsy. This is the home of proprietary science that we're going to use. To Rico's point, listen, there's a lot of sturm and drang and debate out there. Very polarizing. Some Mm -hmm. people feel like Creed and Nickelback and Puddle of Mud and those other late 90s early 2000 uh, post grunge bands were directly responsible for the death of rock and roll as if rock and roll went from 1955 and carl perkins chuck berry elvis presley to 1999 2001 creed and nickelback and gr- and just ground to a halt it just fell off the face of the earth <laughs> yes. right just jumped went thelma and Lee's, louise and just drove off the cliff right yeah you bet man so we've got to use some proprietary science to figure out if this did in fact kill rock and roll so please i would ask you dear listener set aside any preconceived notions you have about this very controversial band and song and allow us to do the heavy lifting don't bring your own implicit bias with this okay that is correct thank you rico do you want to get down to business let's do it all right well proprietary science rock and roll autopsy creed one we've got five categories they are gratuitous boomerism excessive misogyny wanton whiteness malignant machismo and culture vulturism rico the track is one the band is creed the category gratuitous boomerism how do you score um this we're gonna get into some stuff here uh the the subject matter of the song for, for me, honestly, I mean, is a little too Joan Baez, Kumbaya. Let's let's all love one another. That that's that's all fine and dandy, but that's got no fucking business in rock. Okay, rock is is way dirtier, and it, it represents the, the underbelly of society. Just listen to Scott's, um, you know, to Scott's um, speech before we get into this that we play on every episode. That's rock and roll. This isn't rock and roll. This is a little too late '60s flower child for me with regard to rock. You're trying to take, um. You're trying to take grunge and apply flower child topic to it, and it just doesn't work for me. Um, that shit should have stayed in the late 60s. It was fine when it was in the late 60s. There's no place for it now. Even though these guys aren't boomers, they're still acting like boomers, in my opinion, with with regard to the subject matter alone. I personally um going to dial this down to a half a point just because musically – I kind of like it. I mean, music musically Creed's really good. Um, so I'm just going to only do a half point on this. All right. Scott Stapp is 50 years old. Um, Mark Tremonti is 49. He's actually my age. These two people, more than probably any other 
rock and rollers we've talked about in 115 some odd episodes are literally like people who lived my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? These are just these these are and especially like if you look at like their childhood and background, I mean similar even backgrounds, just lower middle class white kids that are exactly my age, right? Yeah. So I mean, there's parallels here, man. So I can't ding. I'm not a boomer. I'm a Gen Xer. These guys are Gen Xers. So I'm left holding the subject matter of the song. And you're right. It's trying to say, hey, we should all be unified. Um, I got to be honest with you, man. This is going to be a tough autopsy for me. I'm going to, I kind of had to really think about this one, Rico, and I'm going to yeah. just approach this song and this band and i'm going to try to cast my mind back to 1999 2000 when i was like 24 25 years old yep. and remember what my thoughts were about this band then yep. and i'm going to try to kind of live in that space I'm going to give it a half point as well. I think the subject matter of the song, I think it's, I think it's, it's funny Rico, because I wanted to come into this and I wanted to just, I thought this is going to be like fish in a barrel doing this song. You're just going to hammer Creed because that's what the world does. It's almost like doing Nickelback, right? <laughs> I thought the same thing. And then as soon as we started talking about this, like it was game changer. Like it wasn't like that. Yeah. And then like you do, I'm assuming like you do every autopsy, you did a little bit of field research and then it starts to like change your mind a little bit. Cause I started reading about Scott Stapp and his childhood yeah. and who he is yep. and his background. And I thought I can't come on here and hammer this guy, but I also can't spend 20 minutes in this category. So the lyrics are the lyrics are ham fisted. I'm sorry. Okay. And yes, so that's a good good terminology. Ham, ham fisted. fisted lyrics get you a point five. Yeah, I mean, I can't bang on the dudes like these guys when they recorded this. They were all in college working full time jobs just so that they can drop a hundred bucks each to pay for the studio session. So I can't bang them for that, right? I mean, that's like that's Rico. the way you do it. That's garage, dude. Yeah, it actually Rock. is. It actually is. It's. I think what happened, and I'm glad you said that, and we can go ahead and I don't know if this should have been in another category or whatever, but I'm glad, I'm glad you said it because- It's our fucking pod. We can put it anywhere we want. You're goddamn right. Rico, everything about this band should actually be celebrated if you're a fan of rock. To yeah. your point, these are kids who were working full-time jobs, going to college at Florida State, pooling their money to buy studio time to record these songs that they wrote together. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that album a year later, they're fucking opening for Van Halen. I mean, that's yeah. like, <laughs> that's like everything you want. I mean, that is they did like everything, right? Exactly. Exactly. And they're kids but that the, came I, from <laughs> nothing. Scott Stapp yeah. like grew up on welfare with a dad who beat the shit out of him. I mean, a nightmare childhood. And it's like, this is a rags to riches story where yeah. everybody who's a fan of music and especially live music written by human beings and performed and like authentic, you should be championing this as I can't ever say that championing Ch this champion, championing championing. It's tough. I know. It's I tough to speak been. English, Rico. <laughs> it really is, man. Our language is fucked up. It really is. But, you know, we should be, we should feel good about this. But I will tell you, I fucking hate this song. <laughs> I hate this band. I, I've always hated this music. And I feel bad for saying that. It's just my opinion. If you like it, there's no judgment here. But I just always thought it was like derivative as fuck. And I just, I, it never sat well with me. And then, I'll get more into that later, but yeah, well, what, what we, I, I'm glad that we did this because it's kind of like we're 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 um we're late we're giving the foundation that these guys ought to be celebrated. They ought to be praised for doing it the right way, 
And here now is why everybody hates them. And so we're going to get into that. So I'm glad that we did that instead of just going into the hammer fest and then trying to backpedal at the end. I'm glad we laid it out first. So that, that was, that was a good job. All right, well, let's move on. Excessive yeah. misogyny. Rico, I have the lyrics available if you'd like to hear them. <laughs> but first, I, I, I got to say this. You know, whoever invented the rule that you have to sit down to pee if you're a guy clearly never experienced the 30 seconds of zen that you get when you're sitting down and peeing if you're a dude that you will never get when you're standing up um it, it's really magical and don't let anybody tell you if you're a dude that you can't sit down and pee because it's really a life-changing experience but like standing up when you're done peeing you think you got that shit sh you know shooken off as much as possible and sometimes maybe shake a little too much if you know what i mean i mean i know i've been there a few times but ultimately what happens is you get that fucking dribble, dude. I fucking hate the dribble. But we've solved that problem with the cock cap. You just slip the cock cap on. And now, Scott, and everybody out there, we've got the Rock and Roll Autopsy series. We've got white with the black logo. We've got black with the white logo. It's amazing. Got to get both of them. Imagine if you will. You're out with your lady. You think you're going to get some action. She starts to undress you. She sees the Rock and Roll Autopsy podcast cock cap on. And she's like, she, she looks up at you and she says, Oh shit, you listen to Rock and Roll Autopsy? My friend, you are getting the bonus treatment from her on that very night because you have our logo on your sausage. So do yourself a favor. Do your relationship a favor. Get the Rock and Roll Autopsy cock caps. It's a life changer. Back to you. Affirmative may be justified. Take from one, give to another. The goal is to be unified. Take my hand, be my brother. The payment silenced the masses, sanctified by oppression. Unity took a back seat, sliding further into regression. One, oh, one. The only way is one. 101 the only way is one i feel angry i feel helpless want to change the world yeah i feel violent i feel alone don't try and change my mind no do you need any more lyrics rico uh, no but your spoken word was beautiful as usual well done um see here's the problem with with one one of my problems with creed is they get fucking preachy and sappy all at the, in the wrong ways at the wrong time. And this is one of those examples. I fucking hate how they get sappy and lovey in this fucking song. I hate it. I hate it. But there's no misogyny here. I mean, it's going to get a zero for that, obviously. But um, I, I get the message, man. And, and we'll get to... I've got something else I want to say, but we'll save that for another category. But um, yeah, dude, like it, they get they get sappy at the wrong times, and I think that's one of the things that gets under my skin about them. So to dial it in, it's going to get a zero for me. Yeah, it's it's there's no misogyny here. There's other stuff here, but no misogyny <laughs> at all. Um, I'm going to give it a zero as well. There's other stuff, but. <laughs> I'm going to give it a zero as well. And I'm just going to close the category because the category is specifically about misogyny and it's just yes. not, it's not in yeah. the song. So there's no reason to spend any time here, any more time. That's than a me. good, good idea. All right, let's move on. Category three, one by Creed. And can I just say rock and roll? I'm calling a moratorium on it. No more. It's over. We cannot have another song named one in rock and roll. Three Dog Night, one. Oh, you my two, God. You are so one. right. Metallica, one. Creed, one. Can we stop, please? Enough, okay? Can dead we... horse beaten, okay? Yes, Enough dead already. horse beaten. Agreed. Enough already. Thank you. Category three, wanton whiteness. Creed's one. What do you say, Rico? <sighs> 
Um, the topic is let's all, you know what, dude, gosh, I thought, I thought I had this one nailed down, but the more I think about it. Okay. So if we take, if we look at, if we look at the, the, the subject matter of the song in, in a rock and roll autopsy scientific way, really the, the message of, you know, an ant, let's just put it simply an anti-race message is not a white thing at all that's very cross-cultural i mean that's for obvious reasons i don't think i'm really creating any new concepts there so from that perspective it's really really a zero um but musically dude there's nothing whiter than that style of music um really and and his fucking yarling is is there's nothing whiter which we'll get into that too but there's nothing whiter than that style of music with that style of singing oh, the ramparts we wash were so gallantly streaming so i've got to meet in the middle and go with the point five on that one. I mean, I think it's yes for the whiteness of the presentation of the music, the Yarl, all the '90s tropes are here. Well, I'll talk yes. about that in a later category. The one word, the one word song title. How about that? Oh yeah, yeah. But to me, it's the thing that's the where this is a solid one for me is it's attempting to write a song about racial unity, but doing so by, if I'm reading it correctly and understanding it correctly, saying that affirmative action is a bad thing. And I would think that, I don't know, we don't have an African American on our panel here, but I'd be willing to bet that if we were to talk to folks who have lived their lives as African Americans in the United States of America, they would probably say, you know what? Affirmative action and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the workplace and higher education are a good thing. And so th while in one hand, they're trying to argue for racial unity, on the other hand, they're doing it while advocating for taking away tools that are supposed to advance underprivileged people <laughs> and so i know it's it feels like very um i think the heart is in the right place but i think there's it's kind of uh lacking some and again this is 2024 and they wrote this in 1998 and now we yeah we i talk think I'm a feeling lot you it's it's not the it's not the heart that it's it's the delivery that we have a problem with right yeah and it, it doesn't age well because yeah. we talk a lot these days about implicit bias and how we have to guard against these things and that affirmative mm -hmm. action is actually even though i know the supreme court was struck it down but up until that time you know, it's, and again, it's, I'm, this could go political. I'm not going to go there, but the point being is that these were tools that were put in place to help advance underprivileged privileged people. And the song is very much kind of, if I'm understanding it correctly, arguing against those. And I think it, it you, certainly feels like that to me too. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't need those tools if people would just do the right thing without them. <laughs> But, but people don't well, and people do bring with them you know implicit you know bias subconscious bias if 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 in. ted bundy would just not have murdered those people then we wouldn't need a law <laughs> against murdering somebody unfortunately right. we as human beings are idiots and don't know how to conduct ourselves like fucking adults and so then we need laws to help us out yeah and i think i think that's a great way of putting it and you know, and again, I don't think that they can be judged as I just think, too, they were young. And it's like, you know, maybe today, maybe he doesn't write the same lyric. I don't know. Maybe he does. I don't know. I mean, honestly, is he can write whatever lyric he wants. But I'm just saying that to me, it's white as fuck. That's just how white folks will do you. That's a plus one for me. I don't need I don't need. And on top of that, and maybe I should make this a one, but I'm going to stick with my point five. I don't need affirmative action songs one way or another i don't need that in my rock and roll 
I, I don't need that in my rock. I want point. other things in my rock. I don't want that in my rock. Great, great point. Yeah, I mean, there's other ways to, to you know, be political. And that's why I said, like, you can be political in rock music. People have done that forever. But this attempt feels ham-fisted. And so that's the problem is that's not done well, you know? Well, well, right. And wouldn't you say like, who's the most political band of the nineties rage, rage probably. Yep. Right. Yep. They're, they're certainly more political than, but it's, it's, they, they, they're, they do it the right way and their delivery doesn't take away from the music styling that, that what Creed is doing is they just missed the mark so many times. All right, let's move on. Malignant Machismo won by Three Dog Night. I mean, Creed. Rico, let's say you. (laughs) See, how do we score this? Because if we give them a zero for Malignant Machismo, then that's actually rewarding them for not being macho. But in this case, I want to penalize them for not being macho enough. So... You see what I'm saying? Like, if there's no malignant machismo in there, but I can't give them a zero because I would be rewarding them for the thing that irritates me about them. Yeah, I mean, I guess, like, this is where... So what are you going to go with? What do you think? I, I, don't, I don't know. I think we need to hash this out a little bit. All right, let me talk you through a few of my feelings, yeah. and maybe it'll help you kind of... See, I don't know. Maybe it'll help you kind of form your own, but <laughs> yeah, or get your wheels turning. This era of rock, Rico, is where I really kind of just lost the plot. And up until this point, my entire life, up until I'm like 25 by this point, my entire life, I'm obsessed with rock music, you know? Yeah. And that was something else reading about Scott Stapp. His mom was a big Elvis fan. So, like, his, his, deep voice that he sings with is partially influenced by going for like an Elvis thing. But up until this point, I'm the biggest music fan ever and rock music completely loses me. I'm loving the nineties up to this point, loving the nineties, the early nineties, the grunge movement. I'm, I'm digging everything that's happening. You always talk about the Lilith fair kind of mid era the hyper creative weird kind of psychedelic midpoint of the 90s and now we're in the late 90s and what happens we get post grunge and the pejorative being butt rock where you get nickelback creed puddle of mud you know you you get these guys that are all doing the eddie vetter um lane staley impression go ahead Yes. So what what this version of the 90s is, is the late version of the 80s to the early version of hair metal. It's and I, is that where you were going with this? I, I wasn't, but I actually I agree with that totally is that it's this is the other side of the looking glass at the beginning of the decade. You get the hyper creative, transformative grunge movement. And then at the end of the decade, you get the marketing reps and record label execs have swooped in and signed every band that sounds like a grunge band. And now it's being kind of spit back at us, but it's like a product now, right? Trying to manufacture something that happened organically in the first half of the decade. Right. And, but it's different now because it's still got the drop D guitars. It still doesn't have guitar solos. The song structure, the vocals are an imitation of Eddie Vedder and Lane Staley, but the, like the grunge stuff had like an anger and a cynicism and an authenticity to it. And Nickelback and Creed feels like like almost conservative. You know what I mean? Like, like Creed is like borderline, like Christian rock, right? Which yeah, is fine, yeah. but it's Nothing the exact, wrong with that. but it's the exact opposite of what grunge was, right? Yeah. Only it's using the grunge template, 
You know what I mean? And then Nickelback. Grunge, like, like the first half of the decade was like self-loathing and had disdain for your own self and everybody around you. And it was, it was born out of the hatred of the bullshit surface of the 80s and so there was motivation there and now it's manufactured and formulaic and and i totally understand your point 100 percent. i don't know it's what i'm getting well at done. though i'm just trying to like put myself back in the headspace of where as a music fan i heard this and it like hit me in all the wrong ways i was like i hate all of this to me it just sounded derivative and i thought that creed took like all of the worst aspects of Bono, you know, in terms of being like overly kind of pretentious and preachy and yeah. like put that into like a butt rock band with like super, you know, uh, derivative kind of like Eddie Vedder yarling, right? It just, it just took like a, like it just distilled all the bad things about Bono And then made it, gave it a yarl and had it front a post grunge band. It was just, I hated it, man. I hated all of this. And at this I point, know. it's like, I, know. I just bailed on. I was like, I was out. I stopped paying attention to modern rock music at this point. I was like, I'm, I'm done, you know? And, and the, the thing of it is, is I didn't care that I didn't like what was current because the bands that I still loved were still active in making new records. Yeah. So I knew there was going to be new music on the horizon for me that I cared about, even if it wasn't from a band that was selling millions of records, you know? Yeah. And so, and so this stuff feels gimmicky and gim gimmicky and formulaic. And so it's now it's like where, whereas like Cobain was buying fucking $3 sweaters from the local thrift store. Like they had like Louis Vuitton looking grungy, f grungy thrift store sweaters, but they're actually really nice fucking $200 sweaters that are made to look like grungy $2 thrift store sweaters. You see what I mean? It's all gimmicky and formulaic and manufactured now. And that was the late nineties. And, and that's why we all hated it because it just felt fake and it felt forced. And, and but, I totally get it. But here's the thing. That's me, though. Yeah. But the reality is that these guys, and we already talked about it, they're, yep. where this music came from was every bit as authentic as where those grunge guys from Seattle, where their music True. came from. These were absolutely broke-ass white kids, hard scrabble, writing their own shit, scratching and clawing to make it. You know, it's the same damn story. So why do I hate this stuff? The, and, these dudes were kicking like they were at what's his face's house recording this and they were kicking his fucking kids toys out of the way so they could put set up their mics and shit and recording in their kids bedrooms and stuff so this is like seriously exactly how you would want to make a rock album is the way that they did it but uh, i agree with you 100 percent. i hate the way it turned out yeah i mean none of this was done the wrong way i mean this is what you would want your rock band to be a band that came from nothing and fought their way up and hit it big and the thing of it is too is i'm in the minority here these records these creed records all three of their records were gigantic these were i know multi-million dollars these you could make an argument rico that creed and nickelback were the last two huge rock bands before rock completely fell off kind of like the as being a force culturally in music that this was True. the last gasp you could easily say that and on top of that this this uh one guy that i work with the one that turned me on the turnstile thank thank you for that um 
he is a gigantic Creed fan. Like him and all of his friends are like all big Creed fans. I'm like, man, I don't understand you. Why, why you like Creed so much, but dude, he would pay $200 for a Creed ticket if they were around here. Like he's, and he's like 25. So I, I don't understand it either. I mean, maybe just you and me. And, but there's, that's why we, we open this with them being so polarizing because there's plenty of people out there that hate them for the same reason that we do but if you look at their background it really is a really odd bifurcation here and and it really makes you question why you feel that way it's weird i think a little bit of it i'm guessing those guys you're talking about are younger than i am because i think some of it is perspective and what you bring to the table because in the mid 90s i felt the same way about green day when i first heard green day i hated it i was like and then I heard Blink-182 and I heard all these new punk bands coming out and it pissed me off because I was like, the Ramones couldn't get a platinum record to save their lives. And then these guys come out and they're selling millions of albums right off the shoot. And I, th I thought it was bullshit. You know, I'm like, yeah. this is a, the offspring. I was like, this shit's awful. Go listen to the Dead Kennedys. I, I thought it was terrible that punk had gone mainstream and that these yeah. bands were selling so many records, whereas the bands I loved couldn't get anybody to sneeze at them. And so I always like looked for and valued authenticity, and I just didn't see it with these guys. It all felt derivative. Do you have a malignant machismo yet? I mean, I have to take my opinion out of this and give them a zero because there's no malignant machismo in this song in spite of how i feel about them personally i can't penalize them it, dude science science has science has to rule the day and there's no malignant machismo in this as far as i'm concerned so it's got to give it's got to get a zero i got to give it a 0.5 just for scott stapp's super deep manly voice yeah who does who does a better fake elvis him or glenn danzig uh, I think Glenn is actually, at least when he was young, I think he was a really great singer with a lot of range. Um, yeah. I don't know that Scott Stapp really has that. I think yeah, he's pretty gotcha. limited in his. Who does the best Yarl? Him, Lane Staley, Eddie Vedder. Who does the better Yarl? Oh, God. It's Scott yeah, Stapp. That, is, come on. So Tuffy, Stapp right? is the Yarler, man. Let's move on. Culture <laughs> vulturism, Rico here's where we get a big bold one for everything that we've just talked about listen the 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 can't we get along song was already done in the 80s stevie wonder and paul mccartney did ebony and ivory so that's been <laughs> done um the name one is was done several times the style of music is sounds the even though they did this in somebody's house and it was totally the right way there's very little originality in any of this the yarling was done there's nothing new about that the style of music isn't new the subject matter isn't new the sappy ass lyrics take me out of it sorry I know these guys worked hard to do this album a hundred bucks at a time, but I'm giving them a one for culture vulturism. And if I can score more, I would give them more, but unfortunately I can't. Yeah, it's a, it's a big time one. I mean, it's, this is, this is where it, again, I think I've used the word derivative a million times. I mean, yeah. all of this has been done and to some degree, that's okay, because we see that in rock music all the time, right? There's a million bands that sound like ACDC, right? But you know when you're hearing the real thing, right? You can you can drink a Coke, you can drink an off-brand Coke, but you know when you're drinking the Coca-Cola, right? And this sure. isn't this is an off-brand, you know, this is Fago, this is you know, this is one of those <laughs> <laughs> Although there's nothing like some good old fashioned Fago red pop, my man. That is a fact. Tab oh yeah dude fresca fresca anyway <laughs> I, yeah it's it's a big one for me i don't think yeah. that's and it's a big thing that kind of bothered me about all these bands was this was as if you know like we'll go back to the super friends you remember bizarro superman yes okay these butt rock bands the post grunge bands they're the bizarro grunge bands where you have yes. the grunge bands in early in the decade that are angsty and cynical and they are emblematic of everything that is generation x and yes. then you have the post grunge bands at the end of the decade 
that are the bizarro grunge bands where they're they're oddly they sound alike but something's a little off and they're weirdly positive <laughs> that is so well done uh, that describes the late eight, the late 90s post grunge perfectly it's a bizarro nice version of the angsty early 90s excellent i'm not i couldn't even add to that if i wanted to that that was awesome <laughs> All right, gang. Well, Rico, it's time we wrap it up here. Yeah. Um, this one was harder than I thought it was going to be. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Oh, it was super hard. And, it, and I even watched, you ever watch the uh, punk rock MBNA, I think is his uh, MBA, punk rock MBA on YouTube. He's He's got a channel where he talks about rock music, but yeah. he does an episode on Creed and I, I did watch it. And this man, Scott Stapp, this guy had a hard life, dude. And sure. I feel yeah. for him. And so I don't, I'm not here to rip this guy. This is his no. art. Listen, man, any band I played in, we're the same age. Any band I played in when I was hit, you know, back in the day, his, his, he had more talent than I did because he got out, he got out. And like I said, he got huge and sold millions of records. Any band I was a part of didn't amount to shit. So yep. at the end of the day, scoreboard, right? But so yeah, I, I'm I mean, not, not here to hate on this scott from one scott to another i'm not here to hate on that a boy and hey big propers to them they made this album before pro tools hit so it was done on tape and it was mixed down on tape and then it got remixed and so they did it they really did this the right way and really for me and you and other people out there that hate them you got to at least respect them for doing it quote unquote the right way i mean i gotta respect them for working for it you know what i mean i can't hate on them for that and at the end of the day they're a legit rock band that became super successful and honestly i mean we kind of need one of those like right now you know yeah, so i right. can't i can't begrudge them that either true that all right let's do the math man i've yep. got three points what have you got rico um so let's see 58 square root of nine algorithm to 14 sigma i've got two points 2.0 for a grand total of love five points right in the middle i mean really when you think about it it's exactly where they ought to be yeah um didn't kill rock and roll um you know, it's at the end of the day, when you have that level of success, when you're having like Def Leppard levels of success in terms yeah, of yeah. album sales, you're really bringing the rock and roll message to the masses. It may not have been my particular brand of rock and roll, nope. but your colleagues at work love them. So that just, you know, that keeping passing the torch on, keeping the spirit alive could be the reason why some other kid picks up a guitar, you know, so certainly didn't kill it absolutely all right man yeah we did it we got through it and and now got my through another one my algorithm on spotify is completely fucked as it's recommending me nothing but creed puddle of mud and nickelback song oh god i'm sorry for that can, how can, can you can you can you reset a spotify algorithm i is don't that think you can even? but what you can do is Listen to Ace Frehley's new record in 45 minutes, and that'll Listen, set it right. Listen, go out of your way because it's kind of like taking DMT and talking to God. Like listening to 10,000 volts is like audio DMT. You will feel <laughs> at one with the universe. So do yourselves a favor. <laughs> All right, gang. It's been Rock and Roll Autopsy. Good night now. Let me tell you, so the lyrics to real rock music is nothing more than satanic cyanide. Get it out of your house, throw it out, and burn it. It has no place in the house of the righteous. Hey guys, it was like a mistake. There's no mistake anymore. 
Follow us on Twitter at RNR Autopsy, or you can send an email to rock and roll autopsy at gmail.com. And if we run across anything good, we'll mention it in a future episode. Thanks for listening. Later. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Before you go, if you like heavy metal and stories, then you'll love Battle of the Bands, the narrative form metal podcast that unpacks the biggest rivalries in rock and metal history. Season 1 took in Megadeth versus Metallica, and Season 2 went across the divide to explore the beef between Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. It's like Business Wars, but metal. Find Battle of the Bands wherever you listen to your podcasts, or visit battleofthebandspod.com.